Hi, good morning, PMC family. Today we shall continue with our First Thessalonians series. But before that, I just want you to imagine, you know, you are if you are a mentor and you have disciples under you, and your disciple is about you know, to leave the country, what words would you give your disciple? Or if you are a parent and your child is leaving for another country for studies, what important words would you give your child? You know, Paul has some important words to leave for his disciples, his family, his spiritual children. Paul knew that the best way to safeguard their lives is a life with Jesus. And a life with Christ is to live a holy life, holy living, which is the title for today's sermon. Let it shed some light from us, for us, in fact, as we learn from Paul's epistle to the church in Thessalonica. You know, I hope you are excited to know what words Paul was leaving his disciples because I am excited to share with you some of the gems of to holy living. But let us turn first to the scripture to understand these gems that Paul has left for his disciples. Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 to, 3, to 12. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And in fact, you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that, is, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, there are basically two segments to Paul's holy living. It is simply loving God and loving people or our neighbours. So for the segment on loving God, Paul stated that holy living is to live a life that pleases God. And that is my first point. You know, holy living is a life that pleases God. But what is a life that pleases God? Simply, it is a life that glorifies God and not ourselves. It is a life that is serving God and not ourselves. It is a life that is walking God's way and not our ways. Sometimes going God's way meant that it is not so comfortable, you know, not so familiar. It requires some form of work, some effort, some sacrifice, or even some suffering. Like the church in Thessalonica who had gone through some form of persecutions. And sometimes when we face such difficult direction, we decided to deem it as, um, I mean, this cannot be God's way. Huh? And we brush it off and waited for God to speak again. And when God doesn't speak again, we complain that God is silent. But God had already spoken. Sometimes it is worse, we, we blame God for abandoning us. We blame God for causing us you know, to suffer you know, all these hurts and pains. We tend to respond positively when God's way is also our preferred way, our most comfortable way, our familiar way. But we have a tendency to respond negatively, especially when we find difficulty in going God's way. But holy living is about pleasing God and not about pleasing ourselves. 
You know, I just watched um, this movie titled The Twelve Mighty Orphans and felt that, no, this is one of the best non-fiction movies. So Coach Rusty Russell, he left a better, more comfortable, uh, higher paying job at Temple High School where he was already a successful coach to become so that he can become a science teacher and a head football coach at Fort Worth Masonic Home and School. He went from a prestigious school where he was a successful coach to a school for orphans where there was nothing. They have nothing. They don't even have shoes to wear, in fact. But this man, Rusty Russell, gave the orphans hope and built a team that was able to challenge with the best. But he had to suffer a few years first. And what he had done became legendary. If God were to ask you to do something like this, would you make the sacrifice? You may ask, why should we do it? Well, because such sacrifices touches lives and it pleases God. Making such a change in your life is holy living. And holy living is living a life that pleases God. It's living a life that follows God's direction. It's living a life that do what God wants of us. So what also pleases God also, uh, is to follow His, His instructions to live a life free from sin. That is also holy living. It is living our daily lives in obedience and free from sin. But we must recognize that holy living is not an event. Holy living is not a one-time event. Holy living is not something that you do once and then you get promoted to another level and you forgot all about you know, living it again. And, this, and my second point to loving God is holy living is about living with Jesus more and more. Living with Jesus more and more. We have to live and walk with Jesus more and more. We have to grow with Jesus. Holy living is not a status or a position where we earn it and get into. Holy living is about living a relationship with Jesus. And a relationship with Jesus means that we get to know Jesus more and more when we spend more time with Jesus. So when we spend more time with a person and when we talk more, it's natural that we know the person more and more. We get to know the person better. It is the same with our relationship with Jesus. We will know Jesus more and more. And when we spend more and more time with Jesus, we will love Him more and more. You do not just read about Jesus in the Bible and say, you know, oh, I know Jesus because I read about Him in the Bible. We have to live it out. We have to live the life of Jesus. But how can we live with Jesus more and more? What instructions did Paul give? You know, in, in, in verse 2, Paul stated this, For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Remember Pastor Isaac preached on transformed by the gospel? That he talked how the gospel transformed our DOC, desire, object, objective and conduct. The gospel is where these instructions can be found. In his gospel, and this gospel is about Jesus. So Paul wanted the Thessalonians to live what is in the gospel. There's one, one more thing that we need to do. We need to recognize the authority of our Lord Jesus. More than often, of, you know, sometimes although we call Jesus Lord and God, we do not recognize His authority. Some of us only recognize the authority of God on Sundays. And you know, now it's worse. It's COVID time. For some of you, there's no Sunday. You know, you do not have a Sunday to prompt you. And thus, we fall into sin. We commit what I call the David and Bathsheba sin. So what was on David's mind when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and later murdered her husband, Uriah, who was a very faithful and good man. You see, as king over all Israel, 
he probably felt that he doesn't need to come under God's authority anymore. He probably felt that you know, he can get away with sin as he is king because he is the authority over the land. He failed to recognize God's authority. David failed. Sometimes when we are high up in authority, power and pride get into our head and our heart. So if you want to live with Jesus more and more, we need to recognize Jesus' authority. If we do not, we will fall into sexual immorality, like, which leads to my next point. Holy living is living a life free of sexual immoral immorality. So what did Paul talk about sexual immorality? Well, we see sex outside marriage outside of marriage is the most prevalent sin in the days of Paul and also today. King David, as I mentioned earlier, the man after God's heart also fell into sexual immorality. There are, there are other forms of sexual immorality. The most common is pornography. You know, pornography is, is, comes from the Greek word pornia, pornia which was used, in fact, used here in, to this, in this passage to describe sexual immorality. And, include, and that includes fornication, which is sex, sex outside of marriage and also other unnatural sex. Although not everything is spelt out here, but I will leave the Holy Spirit to convict your heart if you have committed sexual immorality. The problem with sex is that there is, Sex is not the problem. You know, it is a gift from God. Sex is not the problem. But sex has to be enjoyed under the covenant of marriage. And why do we have to do so? Well, first thing is that God created us this way. In the same way, we experience love and commitment with God. We experience love and commitment with our spouse through marriage. God created sex for us to cultivate and, you know, and it is also for us to express our love toward one another with our, with our spouse. And this is best done under commitment and the covenant of marriage. And under the covenant of marriage, sex builds up the relationship and it develops love and intimacy between your, you and your spouse. However, sex outside the marriage creates anxiety insecurity because there is no covering from God and there is also no commitment. Sex outside of marriage does not encourage commitment. In fact, it encourages one to freely have multiple partners without, without love and commitment. Sex outside of marriage does not transform into a wholesome family. Why? You see, Sex is not just a physical experience. Sex binds two persons together spiritually. And that is why sex has to be enjoyed only you know, after a spiritual marriage under the covering of God. Why is sexual immorality so powerful in leading us away from Jesus? You know, verse 4, verse 4, Paul stated this, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. Sexual immorality is, will make you lose control over our bodies to unholiness, to passionate lust. So when a person commits sexual immorality, you lose control over yourself. And when your passion, your passionate love takes over you, or passionate lust, sorry, takes over your heart and mind, you lose yourself. You know the right that you ought to do, but yet you do not do it because lust draws you further away from holiness. It draws you away from God. Holiness begins to slide down the moment you give in to sexual immorality. 
God wants you, God wants us to obey His instructions. And He wants us to prosper. But when we do not obey His instructions, and the moment we commit sexual immorality, we know that we will have lost something. We will have lost God inside us. We know something different the moment we committed sexual immorality. You can feel the distance between you and God. However, when you resist, you know that you have gone through another level of learning to control your body with the power of the Holy Spirit. You learn to lead a holy and honourable life of Christ. Sexual immorality is a sin like all other sins. It separates us from God. You know, if, if you remember my previous sermon, I shared that the only way for us to resist sin, to fight sin, is to let the Holy Spirit help us. The Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit can help us fight sin. Remember that I said that there is no way you can fight sin with your own strength, by, your, by, being, self, by being self-disciplined? Taking up, or sometimes you say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll occupy my time by taking up other hobbies, by exercising. Well, those will help you after you recognize and seek the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we let the Holy Spirit strengthen us and build up our character, we can fight sexual immorality, not alone, but with God, with the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit has a power to strengthen, build up, and even transform our character. You know, whenever I met my old friends from primary school or secondary school, and when they come to this topic about occupation, you know, when they ask me about my occupation, about my occupation, I more than often I would have to repeat twice or even thrice because they could not believe that uh, I am a pastor. Yes, meeting Jesus changed my character. And this can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm able to be strengthened and built up to be the person I am today is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't be able to change myself, but it is the Holy Spirit at work within me that helped me to be the person I am now. So when we let the Holy Spirit empower us, we can fight sin. In fact, we can face anything. Remember this, sin is not just a physical act. It is also spiritual. Sin is a spiritual act too. It kills you spiritually too. And that is why we need the Spirit of God to help us to counter the spiritual sin. We need the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. We need the Holy Spirit to set us apart Holy living is allowing the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. And my fourth point is this, that holy living is living a life that is sanctified. But what does it mean to be sanctified? Well, this is quite a big word for most of us. Basically, to be sanctified is to be set apart. But set apart for what and from what? We are set apart for God's special use and purpose. And what are the special use and purpose that God has for us? We are set apart to be God's representation because we represent God. We represent God. We are His witnesses. And God is holy. And because God is holy, we also are holy. And we also have to be holy. And because we are holy through Christ, we are set apart from sin and the world. You know what? This is also mentioned in our uh, Articles of Religion of the Methodist Church, Article 26. And it says this, Sanctification, sanctification this is mentioned by Wesley, sanctific, Sanctification is that renewal of our fallen nature by the Holy Ghost, received through faith in Jesus Christ, whose blood of atonement cleansed from all sin, whereby we are not only delivered from the guilt of sin, but are washed from its pollution, saved from its power, and are enabled through grace to love God with all our hearts and to walk in His holy commandments blameless. 
we are being renewed from our fallen nature by the Holy Spirit. Remember my previous point in regards to allowing the Holy Spirit to strengthen and edify us. Well, here it is again. We are being renewed, transformed by the Holy Spirit. And it begins by believing in our Lord Jesus Christ, that His blood will deliver us from sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are saved by the power of Jesus and we are also enabled and empowered by the grace of God to love God with our wholehearted devotion and to follow God's holy commands so that we can love God and love people. We are enabled to overcome sin. And one very common sin is taking advantage of our brother and sister. Therefore, my faith point, holy living is not to take advantage of a brother or sister. You know, this comes under the segment of loving people. You now, if we truly love our brother and sister, we would not want to take advantage of them. Thus, holy living is not to take advantage of a brother or sister. You now, there are two Greek words he used here to describe this action. And I believe Paul wanted to place greater emphasis on this. The first Greek word, phleon, phleon chateho, means to have more and to overreach. Okay? It means to have more and you overreach. So taking advantage of a brother or sister meant that you have a larger share than your brothers or sisters. You have a larger portion and leaving your brother and sisters with a lesser portion or sometimes none at all. Or you have taken a better share or a better portion leaving an inferior or a lousier part or item you know, for your brother or sister. It also meant that you have you know, you're overreach. So you have overextended your arm to grab a bigger share than you should. You know, I like the recent advertisement, advertisement okay, that, uh, regarding retirement here in Singapore. It was about this sister who gave up her share of the inheritance of the house for her brother and his family. I believe that that is a good example of not taking advantage of our brother and sister. You know, here in PMC, our pastors practice a lot of love you know, when, we, when it comes to makan you know, or eating. Pastor John would always order more so that we can eat well. And we would love and we often would love to practice generosity by giving more to the youngest pastor to eat. Hence, we will always let Pastor Isaac have the bigger portion. <laughs> what about the other Greek word being used? Hupabae. Hupabaon, sorry. It means to step over or transgress. To step over, you know, that's a very interesting translation probably signifies that you know, we step over or make use of our brother or sister to get what we want. We make our brother or sister take the blame or in fact to take the fall. Or we have used our brother and sister as a stepping stone. You know, this reminded me of an old story that my grandmother used to say, you know, that we should not step over a person who is seated down because it will cause the person to stop growing. You know, although this is a folk tale, but we can learn something from here. If we continue to step over and take advantage of our brother and sister, how are they going to take courage to grow in their lives? If we continue to use them as a stepping stone for our success, how are they going to become a successful person themselves? Want to know? Whether have you taken advantage of your brother or sister? Simply ask them. If you have taken advantage of them, it is time to start loving, to start loving them instead. It is time to show genuine love. And holy living is loving one another more and more, which is my sixth point. You know, it is definitely not about taking advantage of our brother and sister. Think about it. Loving a person cannot be a touch-and-go thing. Love grows when we, you know, at, 
love grows and we are told to love each other more and more. Now this is a rather similar instruction to loving, living and walking with God more and more. Love God and loving people is infectious. It is not a one-time event. It is a relationship, which I mentioned before. And in a relationship, we love each other more and more because love grows. Love doesn't stop with one action. Love is not only shown during birthdays or demonstrated you know, only during special events. Love grows and we want to love each other more and more. If we truly love each other more and more, it is natural for us to want to do so more and more. You know, in First Thessalonians 3 verse 12 says this, that may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. Love grows and overflow for each other and for everyone else. When people who does not know about God see the way we love one another, they also will want to know who this God is and why are we able to love in such manner. So let us let our love increase and overflow more and more. And that is so important that may we truly love one another. You know, Paul's final point, um, as we go on to this, it's rather interesting. He states that holy living is leading a daily holy life. So Paul mentioned it in verse 11 and 12. And he says that, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Hmm. Quiet life. You should mind your own business hmm, and work with your hands, just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. So why did Paul give this rather odd instruction? Well, Paul, I rem if you remember that Paul and his team were under scrutiny from their persecutors who had given false information about how Paul and his team uh, was there to teach for their own benefits. You know, Pastor, Pastor Jason mentioned that uh, there were other philosophers and uh, teachers or false teachers who had traveled to Thessalonica you know, to benefit from their own teaching, not only to get food and lodging, but also to milk from, for financial benefits. Hence, Paul caught them, you know, wrote this letter to tell them to be above reproach, not to depend on the community financially. Paul gave them instruction to lead a quiet life. Have a business of your own, you know, start a business of your own and work with your own hands so that when you teach the people in Thessalonica about Jesus, others you know, would believe in you because others would weigh their daily lives or their, their daily living with that of their teaching. And perhaps that was why Paul became a tent maker to pay for himself and his traveler and his traveling companions during their stay, you know, in the different cities. Paul didn't want any form of dependency to be used against the church to hinder the gospel from growing in the hearts of the people. And perhaps what Paul also wanted to do was to instruct the people in Thessalonica and something that we can take home, you know, that our daily lives and our teaching of the gospel, this too must tally. Your teaching must match your character. Your daily life must match your Sunday life. So what you say and what you do must match. When our lives is in tune, we will win the respect of others when we share the gospel and they will believe in Jesus. So holy living it's about living a daily holy life. It is a daily affair to live a holy life. It is not just a one-time or a Sunday event. It is in our blood. Holy living is what God wants of us. And holy living is, a, is living a life that pleases God. Holy living is about living with Jesus, walking with Jesus, loving Jesus more and more. Holy living is a life free of sexual immorality. 
Holy living is living a life that is sanctified. Holy living is not to take advantage of a brother or sister. And holy living is loving one another more and more. Holy living is, la- is living or leading a daily holy life. And I pray, I just want to pray with you that you will want to live a holy life. And it's truly available, it's truly possible because the Holy Spirit is in us. We are able, we are able to gain Christian perfection because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit wants us. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, let us be enabled to live a holy life. You know, I felt that there are some of you struggling with sexual immorality. It hurts. It hurts a lot when after you committed it and you can feel your conscience, you can feel your heart dropping and you're losing your love for Christ. I just felt God saying this to you. Seek for His forgiveness. Repent. Turn from your sin. And let Jesus love you again. Walk righteously. Come under His covering. Let Him bless you. Let Him give you strength. Let Him change your character. Transform your character. Let Him enable you so that you have the ability to overcome sin. Do not let sin win over your life. But live a holy life and let God, let Holy Spirit lead you out of sin.